Well, good evening. Don't let that picture fool you. This is not going to be a big slideshow about all the things we saw while we were gone, but I do want to use some of the places as a illustrative of what I want to talk about tonight. And by the way, what a feed we had this morning. Wasn't that great? John did a great job, I think, and uh, he did it before and did it twice this morning. Really, really good work. Appreciate that very much. I also appreciate uh, those who spoke in my absence. Now, I know Mike preaches all the time and Titus preaches all the time, but who else was in there? Joe Hammond. He, he took a stand, didn't he? Remember that lesson? Great lesson. It's uh, very much enjoyed that when I listened to it, so I appreciate that very much. Before we get to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's see something that Paul writes here to the church at Corinth. And as you're turning to that text, 1 Corinthians 3, keep in mind what cities like Corinth were like in the day of Jesus and Paul and the apostles. You'd go to one of these thriving metropolises, and what was it filled with but temples? All over the place. It seemed like every god had their temple. And Corinth was no exception. And so in that context, Paul talks to the church in this way. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Brethren, I could not speak to you as spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, now you're not yet able, for you're still fleshly. For since there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? For one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos. Are you not mere men? What then is Apollos, and what is Paul? Servants. Through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field. God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it, because... It is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. And then that brings us to verse 16. Do you not know that you are a temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwells in you. That's the question. Do you not know this? And they either did or they didn't. But that didn't change the fact that that's what they were. They were the temple of the living God. Temples all over Corinth. Temples all over Ephesus. Temples all over every major city of that day. And yet Paul writes to them and he says, you guys are temples of the true and living God, the only true and living God. His spirit lives in you. And guess what's true of us here at Choctaw? Same thing. Same thing. Would you rather go to a church or would you rather be the church? What is this building here? Sheepshed. We learned to call it that years ago, didn't we? Because that's what it is. We are the Lord's sheep. We are his flock. And this is where we gather. And we worship in this place. I like the way John talked about it this morning. About uh, coming in here to worship. And who do we want to get close to when we worship? Want to get close to the Lord. Get close to the shepherd. Do we have to be here to do that? And I'm not talking about the assembly. This isn't a trick question. I'm just saying that as we live life. 
Are you any closer to Jesus in here than you are when you live your life from one day to the next? That's not a trick question either. And the answer is no. <laughs> if the Spirit of God lives in you, if the Spirit of God lives in me, everywhere we go, we take the Spirit of God with us. Actually, he goes with us, and we belong to Christ. He is our shepherd. We follow him. It doesn't matter where we are geographically. The idea for this lesson came up on the trip. This just looks like a, a church, but it's actually inside a church. If you look in the background, you can see the, the, the domed wall that, that will rise up and be domed at the top. This is the church of the Holy Sepulchre. This is one of at least two places in Jerusalem where it is claimed Jesus was buried. Anything strike you odd about that? We know he was only buried once, and that didn't last very long, did it? This is one place. And so some people coming to believe that this was the place, at least wanting some others to believe, I don't know exactly how all that worked, but they said this is the place, and so they built a church here, and people throng to this place as some place that is to be revered, some place that is to be considered holy. As a matter of fact, you, you can't really get a feel for it from the picture. But this place was jam-packed with people. It was just for an instant that there was a little bit of space around Debbie there as I took that picture, but mostly we were shoulder to shoulder with folks. And you can't really tell it, but that bunch of people underneath that, that dark-colored edifice is actually a circle of people going all the way around that place several times. That was a line to go through that place, and it took an hour and a half for you to get through that line. And so people were coming to stand in line to go through this place that is the supposed burial place of Jesus Christ. And I don't have to tell you, it felt weird to be there, to see that many people who were thronging just to be at that place. That might sound odd, but maybe this will help. This is just adjacent to the Holy Sepulcher, as that is it is called. And this little altar thing you see, I, I should have brought the laser pointer. Can you see the person underneath that altar? If you can make out the image of a person, they are under that little altar because under that altar is the place where it is said the cross of Christ was dropped into the ground. That's supposed to be the, the hole right there where Christ's cross was planted in the ground. Is it possible that that could be the place? Well, when you look at the geography of where this place is located, I don't think so. I don't think anybody knows. We'll talk more about that later. But it's the idea that people want to come to this place. They bow down. They get on their hands and knees, and they crawl under there to kiss that place where the cross was put in the ground. This is a church that people consider holy, but what God has done is to make you and me his church and put his spirit in us, and in so doing, what did we talk about this morning but holiness and sanctification? God has set us apart by his spirit. He has sealed us his. We don't have to go to some place to find holiness. We don't have to kiss anything on the ground where Jesus walked or was. We don't even know that that was the place. And yet, this is the devotion that some people show to places like this. And I'm not here to, to criticize them, per se. I'm not here to judge them. I'm here to say, I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking this is not anything that Jesus had in mind. When you read the New Testament, this is not what I get out of the New Testament. Nothing like this. And yet, this is what we see. This is another place that is said to be the burial place of Jesus. This is the garden tomb. I have more pictures of it, but I just wanted to show you a couple of places of it. This is the actual tomb in the garden, and that's Liam and Jamie preparing to go in. I'm obviously standing right behind them taking the picture. Only seven people could go in here at a time because that's the size it is, and you're not allowed to stay very long. You have to go in and you have to come right back out. Uh, what some people do, the reason they have that rule is because some people bring cloths with them and they go into places like this and they rub those cloths on the stones and then they take those cloths back home and they sell them at great profit 
to people who want to have something that has touched things that are holy. And we don't even know if this is the place. And I, I see these things and I think, now you, you judge me for yourself. But does that not sound like idolatry? Does that not sound like some kind of a heathen, pagan practice? God has made us his church. He's put his spirit in you. He's put his spirit in me. We are the dwelling place of the living God. He is our shepherd and we are his sheep. He is the head of the church. We are his body. He is the bride or he is the bridegroom. We are the bride. This is the relationship we have with Christ. This is a place that is claimed to be the place of the skull. Do you see a skull looking place there? Yeah, I, I do too. It, it's kind of been an odd place. It's over a highway now. So you can't stand right in front of it. I don't know who got this picture, but they were probably on the back of a truck as it drove underneath it because that's about the only way you can do it. Where you can stand, I didn't take this picture, by the way. This is one I got off the Internet. I tried to take a picture of this place from the side where, where you're allowed to go up and view it. But, but where you're viewing it from, they have these metal uh, screens with bars, and apparently that's to prevent people from throwing things up into that area. Uh, because it's a, places like this are often targets for terrorism. But at any rate, whatever those things were for, you couldn't really take a very good picture through it. But somebody got this picture. And at the proper time of day, when the shading is right, you can see this, this area over, over to the right here, as you're looking at it, does appear to have eye sockets and, and a nose. This might be the place of the skull. It's, <clears throat> it's interesting if this is not that place that it looks like that because how many places have you seen in life that look like the place of a skull so this might be pretty close this might be uh, the place who knows nobody can actually say for sure by the way i'll give you my opinion on this that's what you came for wasn't it to hear my opinion my opinion is that god doesn't allow us to nail down too many places like this if any of them because this is what we do with them as people we tend to make those things holy and places of worship more, on, more so than God ever intended us to make them. And that was not his point or purpose all along. And so he has allowed many of these places to be obscured to the point where we, we can't say for sure that this was the place. And this is another place just like that. Dome of the Rock up on Temple Mount. This is not a mosque. This is a shrine the mosque is adjacent to it, and this is in the area where the temple used to be. But our guide, like many other Israelis, believes that this mosque or this, uh, this shrine is not where the temple used to be, but it's close to where it used to be, and the temple is actually more uh, around the area where we're standing and taking this picture. Whether that can even be proven, I don't think is, uh, is to be solved. But... This is up there and causing great controversy because it's in the place, the area where the temple used to be. And, of course, the Jewish temple's not there anymore. And we've got an Islamic, uh, there's a mosque adjacent to this. And we have this Islamic shrine to Muhammad. Here's the lovely ladies' wear that was mandatory for ladies to wear. It had to have your, your sleeves covered. And some of our ladies were a little upset about that because... They were, had been asking, do we have to cover our, our arms? Because they had clothes to wear and things to take to cover them that wouldn't be hot and, and gaudy. And these garments were warm. It was in the 90s that day, and it was pretty warm. And they still had to put these things on and wear them around. It was mandatory. There's the dome again, the same dome that is the, the shrine to Muhammad. And below this is, what is this but the Wailing Wall? It's the western wall the only part remaining of the original temple remember jesus said in matthew 24 that when the romans would come and he didn't say the romans but he said that not one stone would be left on another of the temple and so everything was torn down this is the only place that is left that can be said that was part of the original foundation of the temple and so jews go here on a regular on a daily basis to worship and to pray and you can't see it here. I probably should have taken some pictures. I'm sure I have some other pictures. I'll show it another time. But they would, they would write out prayers if they couldn't go there. 
and give those prayers on that piece of paper to somebody who was going there, and they would fold those papers up and stash them in the crevices of the rock. So your prayer is on a piece of paper carried by somebody else to be stashed in a place in hopes that God would hear it. Bless their hearts. If you're in Christ, all you have to do is open your heart. You don't even have to open your mouth. Does he hear our prayer? Of course he does. All the time, any place, any time, about anything, God always is ready to hear us. Why is that? Because he lives in us. He put his spirit in us. We don't have to go any place. We don't have to see anything. We don't have to touch anything. We already are temples of God. Is this the last one? How do I change this one? Is there another one? I think this is it. All right. Very good. What is a temple anyway? A temple is a place where you go to worship. What does that have to do with what you and I are as temples of God? In Hebrews chapter 11... This is what we read about Jacob. Chapter 5, chapter 11. In chapter 11, we're reading about the faith of those who've gone before us. And we get down to verse 21, and it says this. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped leaning on the top of his staff. Where was he exactly? Well, we don't know. That's not the point. It's not about where he was. It's what he did. He was a man who had a relationship with God, and he worshiped God leaning on his staff. You and I, as temples, we we worship anywhere we please, anywhere we want. We also can worship God, as, as it says, leaning on our staff or driving in our car. We have the right as his people, as his sheep, as his temple, if you will, to worship him wherever. We assemble for worship, and we should, because that was the practice of the early church, and that's what we're taught to do. But we're not limited to worship while we're here. You remember what Jesus said to the woman at the well? God is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And I don't think he was talking simply about the assembly in that case. He's talking about those who will worship him, who will be so committed, so devoted to him, that they will worship because of their their evaluation of him and their lives. And so that's what we do as temples of God. We value God and we honor God. And that's another thing that temples are for. They are for the purpose of honoring God. In Matthew chapter 15, we read this, as Jesus was talking to the Pharisees who did not honor God. He said, you hypocrites, this is Matthew 15, verse 7. Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. Isaiah prophesied 1,500 years, or 700 years earlier, rather. But 700 years earlier, what Isaiah said was still true about these people, and it remains true today in in the lives of many. And he quotes Isaiah. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Why are temples built? They're built to honor a God. And we are temples built to give honor to God. And how do we do that? We do that by keeping his word. That's what Jesus is talking about here. In another place, he asked the question, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, finish it for me, and do not do the things that I say? Honor is what we do when we obey God. And that's what he's talking about here. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. The precepts of men, the ideas of men, the thoughts of men. No matter how noble the thoughts of men may seem or sound, no matter how wise or wonderful If they are the precepts of men, that's all they are, and teaching those and holding to those does not honor God. The only way to honor God is to keep his word, to live by what he says. And so that's what we strive to do in in restoring all things biblical. That's what Jesus teaches us to do here.
In Luke chapter 9, Jesus talks about sacrifice. And you can't hardly think about a temple without thinking about sacrifice. And if you're familiar with, Jesus, with what Jesus says, the sacrifice he's talking about is ourselves. And this is how he puts it. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. He was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. What does Jesus require of us but to give up our lives? What more of a sacrifice can we make? That temple mount where you saw the shrine to Muhammad, where the temple had been sitting hundreds of years before, that's also the place where Abraham took Isaac to offer him up to God. And you may remember from that account that when he raised his knife to kill his son Isaac, that God stayed his hand through an angel and provided a ram. Abraham was about to sacrifice his son. Why was Abraham about to do that? Because Abraham had already sacrificed himself to God. That's why he was able to do that. Then we read in Hebrews that Abraham was also able to do that because he believed that God was able to raise his son from the dead. That's the kind of faith that Abraham had in God, and that's the kind of faith that you and I need, through which faith we will sacrifice ourselves, offer ourselves up to God, and everything we have up to God. And then when we read in Romans chapter 12, I hope this is a familiar text to all of you, where Paul writes about the sacrifice we make with our own body, our own flesh. Romans chapter 12, the first two verses, Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So we're proving again what the will of God is by offering ourselves up in worship. That's what a temple is for. A temple is a place where God is honored. A temple is a place where God is worshipped. And a temple is a place where sacrifices are made. And that's what we do. We sacrifice ourselves and all we have to the name of Christ. The last thing I'll talk about regarding a temple and what it's for. A temple is a place where you go to learn. So if you're a temple... What should other people be able to do in your presence? Should be able to learn in your presence something of the Lord God Almighty and of his ways. By watching us, yes. By seeing our example, yes. By hearing our speech, yes. All of these things should teach. But I think there are other ways that we can teach. And if you go back with me to where we were this morning in John's lesson, he talked about showing forth something that Peter referred to as the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It's wonderful how these, these ideas, these texts come together. Two different lessons, the same idea. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And you can do that. You can proclaim the excellencies of God. What has God done for you in your life? What comfort have you had because you've been worshiping him and learning from him? You can tell people what a difference it's made just in the peace of mind that you have, following his commandments and teachings. You can teach, you can talk. We, we, we tend to think of it like, oh, no, I'm not a teacher. Well, yeah, you are. We teach people all the time. If you watch a, a movie that impresses you, you'll tell somebody about that movie and, and telling them, what are you doing? You, you may not have realized, but you're teaching them. You're teaching them something about that movie. And even if you don't get the details of the movie right, what you're doing is impressing them with the fact that you really like that movie, or maybe you really hated it, but one way or the other, you're teaching them something. You're pressing your set of values on somebody and showing them by what you say how you, 
how you feel and, and how that movie or how you're responding to that movie. That's what we can do with the Lord, showing forth the excellencies that we've seen in him. If we've tasted that the Lord is good, we can talk to others about how that tastes. I know that's true because we do that with food. Did you tell anybody about anything you ate in there this morning? I was sitting there eating, and, and John was, he was doing great. Wasn't he? he kind of floated around the room, going from place to place and talking to different people. And he sat down across from me because he wanted to talk to, to Judy, I think. Now, I'm going to blame it on you, Judy, anyway. He sat down, and he had a piece of cake, and he said, man, this cake is really good. I'm glad somebody told me to eat it. Well, what does that tell me? That tells me that there was communication going to him to tell him, this is good cake. You need to eat a piece of it. And he ate a piece of it, and he tasted it to see how good it was. And he sat down next to us, and he said, man, this is great cake. And you know what I wanted to do? Yeah. I already had a plate full, so I didn't. But I wanted to go get a piece of that cake. <laughs> And that's the way it ought to be with us. When we show forth in our lives and in our speech the excellencies of God, we can do that in such a way that there will be people who say, you know, I want a piece of that cake. I want some of that Jesus. I want to learn about him. Whatever you've got, I, I need some of that. That's what happens at temples. Teaching is done. And you're a temple. You can teach. You can talk to people and tell them what you know. You don't have to have a three-point lesson or a 13-lesson uh, quarter to, to do some teaching. Just talk to people about the Lord. That's all you have to do. And, and that's what we do all the time. Paul talked about all, that also in Ephesians chapter 3. We, uh, we were here not too long ago. But I want to bring us back to it. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 9. Uh, well, let's just go to verse 10. Paul, he writes on such long sentences. It's really irritating to me. I'd like to have a talk to him about that. That's a joke, by the way. Verse 10, Ephesians 3, 10. So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known, how? Through the church, to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. What do you say? The manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church. Now you interpret that any way you want to, but that is telling us that the church is the means by which God God makes his manifold wisdom known to the world, but not just to the world. Look what it says. To the authorities in heavenly places. Wow, that's pretty high up. But that's what we do as his church, as his temple, as he lives in us. We teach and we show forth the excellencies of his wisdom and of his glory. Well, that's, that's the lesson for tonight. Not anything terribly profound, probably not anything that you haven't heard before, but if I could have taken you with me to that place, if you could have gone with us and seen those throngs of people that I believe are doing what they are doing in ignorance, well-intentioned, I'm sure, wanting to do good, but doing so in ignorance. And I wanted so much to say that this is not what Jesus had in mind. And if they knew what Jesus had in mind, what a relief it would be to know. And I know, many of you have told me, man, you wish you could have gone, and I, I know you do. But you don't need to. Isn't that marvelous? You don't need to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. You don't need to make a pilgrimage to Shiloh. You don't need to make a pilgrimage to Hebron. We went to those places. It was fantastic. It, it's unspeakable, to, the impact that it made. But you don't have to do that. Why don't you have to do that? Because the Jesus who came to those places, the Jesus who was crucified there, the Jesus who was buried there, the Jesus who rose again and ascended to his Father from that place is now living in you. So you don't have to go back there. Now, if you can and you want to, I'd say go. But go before you get old as me. Because you're going to do a lot of walking. You're going to do a lot of climbing. It's, it's the Israeli fitness program is, uh, is what I said it was. And it was great to see all those places. But it's also great. It's, it's even greater to know you don't have to. God doesn't require it. And it, really, the way some folks are doing it, he, he doesn't want that. What he wants is simplicity. What he wants is us to honor him with our lives. What he wants is for us to, to make our sacrifice to him. The fruit of our lips in one place, the scripture says, and our lives given up to his glory in another place. What he wants is for us to follow his teachings. 
That's what he wants of us. And each one of us has the capacity to do that. And he wants us to tell people. And each one of us can surely do that. We always tell people about the good things we experience. We can surely tell them about God. And so there's where we are tonight. We're going to stand and sing a song of encouragement and invitation. Once again, sanctification. If you're outside of Christ, you are not yet sanctified, but God wants to sanctify you. He wants to set you apart through his blood. So if that's what you need tonight or if you need the prayers of this congregation, we're inviting you to come forward and let us know how we can help while we stand and sing this song together.